So welcome everyone to today's presentation. This is the master's seminar being given by Rudra Thacker. Uh, and I am Steve Avers. I'm Rudra's research advisor. And a little bit of background. Rudra arrived here in August of 2021. And he uh, is working with me on a project to study Arctic cyclones in a changing climate. Uh, along with our NCAR uh, collaborators who we're working closely with, and you'll hear more about them today. Ruger's background is actually in environmental engineering. So his bachelor's degree is in environmental engineering, a degree from Gujarat Technological University in Ahmedabad, India. And he has done something really interesting, which you'll find out today, and that is he's taken two topics that are at the forefront of weather and climate news these days, one being Arctic climate change and the other being atmospheric rivers, and he has woven them together into his master's project. So uh, a very timely one uh, indeed. On a personal note, a couple of things that stand out to me about my time with Rudra. One is that he has been an absolute pleasure to mentor. And partly it's because he's a great student, uh, and partly, as you know, he has a great personality. So I've really enjoyed our interactions both professionally and socially. The other thing that stands out is I can't get over the irony that Rudra has gravitated toward a topic of polar research because his hometown in India is the most unpolar climate probably on the whole climate. If you happen to look up the climatology of Ahmedabad, you will discover that its average high temperature in May is 107 degrees. But don't worry, you have a comfortable low of 80 uh, on average. Uh, but from these tropical roots, Rudra has uh, decided to cool off and take on a topic studying the Arctic, and we look forward to hearing all about it today. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the introduction. Steve. It's a great introduction. It's a, it's a cool day to dress up as a radar when there's interesting weather going on outside, so that was not planned. I did not check the radar before coming in. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk about Arctic sea ice, uh, the atmospheric river strikes back. It's a uh, very neat Star Wars reference with Palpatine showing his purple lightning as well. But on a very serious note, uh, the topic is actually Arctic atmospheric rivers and impacts on sea ice in present and future. I would first of all like to thank Steve, uh, my advisor here, and my other advisors at NCAR, uh, Christine Shields, Dallas Dubrivier, Marika Holland, and Laura Landrum, who I'm pretty sure are joining us through YouTube, and also the funding agency NSF and NCAR. So how is it going to look like? I'm going to talk about introduction, then atmospheric rivers, then data and methodology, then results one, which includes observations and reanalysis data sets, and then climate model, and then conclusion and summary. Uh, my main focus would be on the climate model part of it, that how the climate models are doing, uh, and what ARs and sea ice are changing in the future climate. So moving to introduction, I'm going to say that why we need this thing in the Arctic, because Arctic is warming. Uh, you can see that from 1980 to 2022, the air temperature has been gradually increasing, and you see sharp decline in sea ice extent and volume over a very short period of time. I would like to highlight the big dip uh, that happened in the early 2000s, and Clark very graciously told me that that's not a tipping point. It's just the shifts in changing climate. I'm pretty sure Kill agrees. But look at that change, like you, you dropped a lot of sea ice suddenly over a small period of time, which have big impacts. So one of the big impacts, or local impacts, is navigation. So how do you navigate the new Arctic? Does it get more stormier? Does it get less stormier? Once you have sea ice free Arctic, can you actually use ships through that? Uh, impacts on marine ecosystem, uh, once you lose sea ice, you do tons of stuff with the ocean in terms of physical and geochemistry, heating it up. And of course, heat waves into the Arctic. Uh, on a more global scale, uh, there's radiative energy budget changes going on, which a lot of Tristan students are going to agree, uh, who are actually working on free part stuff. That Arctics are supposed to be the thermostat, like they're radiating back all the excess energy through the poles. The ocean warming, uh, once you have no ice, the, all of the heat is being absorbed by oceans, and you end up with higher SSDs there. 
There is a big impact on Atlantic Meridiana overturning circulation or AMOC. And also, uh, funnier stuff going on with mid latitude jets and mid latitude weather. So there are tons of paper which connects Arctic amplification with mid latitude weather. Of course, there are cute polar bears in the Arctic, which we care about a lot. But we also care about the Arctic cod, not just the, the beautiful animals in the Arctic. <laughs> so what are these causes of rapid sea ice loss? So I break it down into two different changes. One is warming climate. You add a bunch of greenhouse gases into the climate. You have more heat in the Arctic that cause rising temperature, accelerates sea ice loss. It's a more gradual sea ice decline that happens in the Arctic. Uh, and the other ones are more circulation changes and extreme events, which are more short term. Like you can have one big cyclone going into the Arctic, and it changes the entire sea ice state. Uh, the big storms happened in 2007 and 2012, which also resulted uh, in one of the lowest sea ice extent in those years. More recently, 2020 and 2021 were also one of the stormier years. And they are studied a lot by different people. How are these extremes changing with the changing climate? So we do see that the wintertime extreme warming events have been increasing. That's shown by a couple of people that your winter cyclone then warming events are increasing in the trends of, in, in the months of November and December, affecting the sea ice. There's also a very interesting paper by Kyle Mattingly, who I see in the audience, shout out to Kyle, which talks about atmospheric rivers over Greenland which plays a crucial role in Greenland ice sheet mass loss acceleration. And that was one of the earliest papers that talked about polar ARs in, in, the, in the North Pole, which is a really interesting paper. However, we are more interested in the sea ice part of it. So what does the literature say about ARs and sea ice? Well, up till February 2023, there was no literature. And I started working on this in 2021. So it was very nice to see a paper which talks about Arctic sea ice and Arctic atmospheric rivers and how they slow down the sea ice growth in the winter. So to familiarize with you this plot, uh, the red line is showing the sea ice growth uh, area with AR, and the blue line is showing what happens without the AR, and it's like pretty obvious that as soon as you have the AR component, you're losing some of the sea ice in the Arctic, which you wouldn't have if there were no ARs. However, the paper does not talk about the seasonality of ARs, ARs in the future, and do climate models capture these extreme events well or not? So these are some of my motivating thoughts to start this work as well. So now we quickly uh, go towards the atmospheric river part of my study, and uh, what are ARs? So the American Meteorological Society has a nice definition, which says that ARs are long air and transit corridor of strong horizontal vapor transport. They're often associated with uh, extratropical low. So they're often associated with, uh, with a cyclone going in, and it's just uh, a part of that. You can see all those horizontal air components hitting the Europe and then some strands hitting the West Coast US. However, because we're interested in studying more Arctic ARs, which might look something like this, and that has a strong meridional component to it, we change the definition a bit to focus on more meridional vapor, water vapor transport. And a snapshot should look something like this. So it's a nice, distinct air hitting the east of Greenland over sea ice. Uh, there's also a big debate going on uh, about atmospheric rivers and cyclones. Because as we saw in the definition, sorry, these ARs are associated with the low. Do we need two physical systems to understand one dynamic problem? Well. My answer to that is, from a climate perspective, that this is entirely one system. Like you can see a low here, and here's the cold front, and here's your atmospheric river, humid, hitting the west coast US. However, if you have two distinct definitions from a climate perspective, it helps you isolate the AR component from the cyclone component, and you can narrow down what physics happens in that, in that captured region, and not what happens with the entire circulation are seen here, here's your atmospheric river, and here's your cyclone. Uh, how do ARs affect sea ice? So there is a thermodynamic reason, and then there is a dynamic reason. The thermodynamics include the radio energy balance, heat fluxes, and precipitation, whereas the dynamic impacts are more about sea ice advection and blowing snow. So I'm going to break these effects down step by step to 
help us follow how these ARs can cause sea ice changes in the Arctic. So here's our sun, which looks more real than my ocean and sea ice, which looks very unrealistic. However, this is my simulation of Arctic. Uh, the left side goes towards the equator, uh, the sea ice and the sun. So the sun is going to signify a summer season in the Arctic. And push, there is a big atmospheric river happening. And people usually associate or imagine ARs with thicker clouds and it makes Arctic more cloudier. So what happens is that it definitely brings winds and heat from the lower latitudes into the Arctic. It also changes the short wave radiation in the Arctic. It also affects the long wave radiation because there's a big layer of cloud present. And I'm pretty sure by this point we have to radiation. And then there's also precipitation happening. So how does the short wave change? So I'm showing the summer season as the sun here and the winter season as nice snow there. The summer has short wave radiation and long wave. Winter does not have a sun there, so it's only going to be long wave radiation emitting outside, emitting from the, from the surface. So these clouds can actually be good for Arctic or reduce the incoming short wave radiation by reflecting back more. And that happens only in summer. However, the long wave radiation is going to be like increased downwelling radiation because of all the warm clouds present there and the heat that was introduced into the Arctic. Moving further, there's heat and rain. And I want to make sure that no matter what the season is, heat and rain will always promote sea ice loss. Uh, lastly, there's snow. And snow is a tricky thing to decode based on the season. So I'm showing the summer month first from the sun. And here's snow falling on the sea ice. Here's our incoming solar radiation. And a lot of that insulation is reflected back because of increased albedo. Like snow has a higher albedo than sea ice. So all of that snow incoming shock wave radiation is radiated back, providing an insulating effect on the snow, which can cause a reduced sea ice melt. However, in winter, the sea ice is trying to grow by losing the heat from the ocean to the atmosphere and you get a nice bottom growth happening in the ocean. And suddenly you have snow there. So what the snow does, it's going to reduce the conductivity flux going up, and you're going to slow down your sea ice growth. So to sum it up, in winter, ARs can have no reason to cause a sea ice gain. Whereas in summer, there's a bunch of radiative effects going on. There's a bunch of heat fluxes going on and snow which can either produce a net gain or net loss on sea ice. We also forgot about winds. So through radiation or through atmosphere and earth interaction through heat and rain and radiation, we don't see much of the sea ice gain happening in winter. However, in, through winds, when the winds blow, the sea ice is advected. And this advection can simulate, or you can see a sea ice gain happening in some regions because the sea ice was moved to a region which had lesser CS extent or lesser CS concentration there. This winds and strong advection, and if there are favorable conditions, can also cause ridge formation in the Arctic, which is another interesting modeling perspective to look into, but we are not going to focus into that for today. So, so far, to sum it up, so far we have seen that Arctic is changing with rapid warming uh, and also causing sea ice loss. We also saw that extremes like atmospheric rivers can cause rapid sea ice changes. So this brings to what my work is about. So the research gap. And we have all been here that here's the previous research, but I'm drifting towards the research gap. So the research gap is there's we don't know much about the seasonality in ARs. And we also don't know that how is changing climate affecting these ARs. And more importantly, do the polar bears still care? about these extreme events or not. And spoiler alert, they, I think they will really care about these extreme events. They don't like that. So moving on to data and method section, uh, I'm going to use two main data sets. One is Mera2, which is modern era retrospective analysis for research and applications, which is a reanalysis data set. It is developed by NASA. And I'm going to use 1980-2019 at a 3 hour resolution, temporal, and then also 0.5 into 0.625 spatial resolution. The other data set I use is climate model. It's a coupled climate model called CESM2, which is Community Earth System Model. It's developed by good researchers at NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research. 
So this model has a historical simulation and a future simulation. The historical simulation runs from 1850 to 2015. And for some of my slides, I'll use the entire simulation. For some, I'll be focusing on 1980 to 2015. It has 40 ensemble members, and it has a six hour temporal resolution and a one by one spatial resolution. The future simulation runs from 2015 to 2100 under the SSP 370 scenario. So that's basically saying that at the end of the century, there's seven watts per meter square of top of the atmosphere radiation. So that's how much you've increased your warming. Following the socioeconomic path of number three, so it's like a middle scenario. It's not the worst one, and it's not the best one. It's somewhere in middle. For method section, I'm going to use an algorithm, which is called Jonathan Willis algorithm, which is widely used for polar atmospheric rivers. There are tons of papers which use this thing for Antarctic atmospheric rivers, and a couple of them used for Arctic atmospheric rivers. So to give you a description, it uses Meridional Integrated Vapor Transport, or VIVT, which is just the northward vapor transport, and vapor transport is humidity, your moisture, and velocity as your meridional wind. The algorithm uses a monthly 98th percentile, so it's going to take out the seasonality uh, in these ARs. And there's also a length restriction which says that this feature should be at least 2,000 kilometers long to define it as AR, because these are like long and narrow transient corridors. It's not a moisture intrusion event. It's supposed to be atmospheric river. To give you another fun analogy, atmospheric rivers is someone who's sprinting across, whereas a moisture intrusion is just like me walking into the Arctic, not caring about it, just sprinting back and forth. So I created this simulation to let you understand how this detection algorithm works. So here's your vapor transport happening across the Arctic. And every time there's a red feature detected, that's the algorithm detecting these ARs hitting the Arctic. And it's a very simple process. It's not a complicated code. It's one of the most simplest algorithm developed. And you just track the 90th percentile moisture transport. And it's also satisfying to look at that GAF for a long time. So moving on to the results one part of the section, which is going to be more observations and reanalysis. Uh, I'm showing you, like, once you detect these algorithms, what does the frequency look like? So it's an Arctic air frequency. And notice that the frequency goes from 0% to 1.2%. So it's, uh, it's something that happens rarely in the Arctic. It's not super frequent. And that's why it's classified as an extreme event. Uh, the annual frequency plot, you can see some of the hot spots in the south of Greenland, some over the Russian permafrost regions, and some back over here, the, the Bering Strait region over there. If you break this plot further down to seasons, here's your winter season with more pronounced ARs, and the summer season, which do not have that pronounced AR frequency or that high frequency. The hot spots are, again, dominated by the winter season and not by the summer season. So the question arises is that why there are more ARs in winter and not in summer? A simple answer is that the baroclinic instability is stronger in winter. That's why you see more storms going in in the winter. And these ARs are often associated with storms. So, again. Yeah. Isn't your detection algorithm, though, isn't it the 98th percentile monthly? Yeah. So it's going to take out that, that monthly climatology as well. Like if you use one absolute threshold, then you cannot use the winter threshold to detect summer. Summer is going to have so much vapor transport going on that you're just going to blow up this figure with all the ARs. But with respect to the months of July or September, those might not be anomalous if you use the winter threshold or annual threshold. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, I guess the... Why would you see a seasonality at all then if you remove the seasonality from the the threshold is, is uh, total transport, or what's the threshold? It is the total transport, 90th percentile of all the 20, all the 40 years. And how do, where does that fall? Okay. And if you use that, and the feature that it should actually look not just at one location, but it should be a 90th percentile like sitting in a shape of a river, then summer won't have that because there are not much storms to start with going in into the summer. Also, this moisture is supposed to be like transported from the mid latitudes or tropics to the poles, and that's going to be because of something going in the tropics. And you won't have that in summer, and you will have that in, in winter. But that's a very good question because that also means that the intensity of these few storms or few ARs in the summer 
are going to be more because there's more moisture and more uh, moisture flux going on as compared to the winter. Yeah, I guess the main thing is, I guess I'm just wondering how that that definition affects the ability to compare between the two, and I guess we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll see that in the future simulations as well. So to talk about sea ice, uh, we isolate regions of ARs. We only look at ARs rather than 12 hours. And then we use daily sea ice changes from NSIT, which is National Snow and Ice Data Center. And they, we use the daily sea ice concentration from them. And we use also, again, a simple methodology that the change in sea ice is just going to be that how much sea ice was there during the day of AR and how much was there before the impact. So that will give you a rate of change of sea ice on a daily scale. So this is you just like make a composite. So how much changes happened when an event occurred in AR, uh, in the architecture. So the impacts look like it's a pretty, pretty neat plot, the west of Greenland and the, and the Nordic seas. And you see sea ice changes happening in a negative value of as high as 15 square kilometers in some regions over there. And uh, it's a pretty big amount, especially if we're just talking about the winter season. So this is the slowing down of your sea ice growth, which the other paper was talking about. Like you're losing the sea ice on a daily scale, and it's going to grow back. I'm not saying that this is a persistent loss. But you missed those days of growing, and that's going to end up giving you a smaller sea ice extent into the Arctic. Moving further to results two, uh, what the climate model is doing. And I'm going to be asking two main, three main questions. Does CESM2 capture Arctic ARs? How do ARs change in future climate? And what are AR impacts on sea ice? So question one, does CSM2 capture Arctic ARs? Again, I'm going to focus on these two data sets. Just a quick overview about that. Notice that MER2 has three early resolution and a much finer spatial resolution than CSM2. And keeping that in mind, if you move to the frequency plot, so again, based on what Dan just asked, there's going to be a trade-off of frequency and intensity. So remind that frequency is just that if a 90th percentile threshold was crossed and there was a distinct shape found in the Arctic, it's going to identify as an AR. How much intense it was, you need to look at the intensity, that how the intensity is changing, how much was the actual vapor transport happening into the Arctic. So this is mirror two, the same annual plot from 1980 to 2015. And here's CSM2, uh, random ensemble member. It's not the first one, it's a random. And all of the ensemble members quite agree with what you see in the observations. The good thing about CSM2, or using any climate model, is that you have more ensemble members. And we require these ensemble members because look at the frequency. It happens only 1% of the time. So if you just use observations or something which has only one simulation, you're going to end up with such a small case study or such a small number of the sample that you cannot do cool statistics later on. So we add all the 40 ensemble members, and the feature smooths out a bit uh, because individual ensemble members are simulated differently, but it still broadly captures the frequency part of it. So the answer is that yes, the frequency is captured by this climate model. What about the intensity? So we're going to focus on the 10 years which is available in all climate models at a higher temporal resolution, 1996 to 2005. It's going to be all times and not just ARs. And you're going to look at distribution plots of these two regions, the Atlantic sector and the Pacific sector, coded by blue and red. And here's how they look like. So here's Atlantic. It's a nice distribution plot. Uh, the spread is shown by the faded bounded region. And the red line is mirror too. However, it's hard to observe the tails, like what's going on here. It's not, it's not clear. So we change the y-axis to a logarithmic y-axis. So as soon as you do that, you're just changing. Like I can go back and forth. It's the same data set, but now you can see what's happening in these tails over there. Once you do that, again, the mirror is the red line. And you can see that it's pretty well captured by the CSM2 ensemble spread, actually quite well. Uh, as we are focused on more extremes, uh, I add the 90th percentile distribution lines. So the red dotted line is 90th percentile of MER2. The white dotted line is the 90th percentile of the ensemble mean. And if you add the ensemble spread, 
then the 90th percentile is also captured by the ensemble members. So it's a good check that CSM2 can be relied on to simulate these ARs. So it captures the intensity well and also the frequency well. So question one, does CSM2 capture optic ARs? It does pretty well. We move on to question two, how do ARs change in future climate? So for this one, uh, we are gonna use a decadal 90th percentile algorithm. So because as you warm up the climate, judging on or like based on the cautious clapper equation, you're just gonna have more vapor water vapor into the Arctic. So how do you deal with capturing something which was anomalous vapor transport and not just Arctic getting more moist? So we feed in the algorithm for each decade instead of feeding on like one big chunk of 85 years. And then you have unique threshold values and unique, unique algorithm for each decade and each ensemble member. Then we compare the last 35 years based on the 1980 to 2015, the current climate period. And in winter, you see that there is a pronounced increase as high as 30% of the time in the Arctic, especially in the Atlantic storm sectors, in the Pacific storm sectors. There's some decrease shown in the mean over these two regions, which we are not sure why is that happening. In the spring, you again see more pronounced increase everywhere across the Arctic. In the fall, which are the months of September, October, November, once you lose all the sea ice in the Arctic, you have open waters, and these open waters are going to fuel all these ARs going in. And notice that how they move further and further into the central Arctic. And lastly, the summer months do not show that frequency increase happening in the Arctic. Again, this is just the frequency plot, all four of them, so it says nothing about the intensity, but I should have. But the summer does not see a pronounced increase. It's more chaotic across the ensemble region. So the key takeaways is that there are more airs in the Arctic in some of the seasons. Because we use the moving threshold, it's, it, it's ignoring the thermodynamic increase in the moisture. And the increasing frequency is going to be because of increasing its tropical cyclones into the Arctic. And that's again going back to the definition. It's these ARs are often associated with cyclones, so it's, uh, I'm just connecting dots with that. Frequency increase in Atlantic sector and the Pacific sector as well, and greater increases in the central Arctic. As you start to lose the sea ice, they're gonna go more and more deeper into, into the Arctic. These results are consensus with other studies which talks about increasing cyclones uh, using observations, climate model, and real analysis data set. So I think the, the general outcome or result here this in consensus. Moving on to the other part, what about the intensity? So again, all times, and not just ARs, we look at meridional vapor transport over those two regions, which I showed earlier. And this time, I'm going to directly show you the logarithmic space plots and not the mean plots. So this is me showing the Atlantic and Pacific region as a nice log counts. Y-axis is how many times these events are like this meridional vapor transport occurs between those two regions. And the x-axis is just the flux in kg per meter per second. Uh, the colors of the lines move from dark blue to dark red, and also moving from years 1850 to 2100. So all the warmer red colors are showing you the end of the century climate, and all the blue colors or cold colors are showing you the start of the simulation climate. And one thing you notice here is that the tails are shifting. Or in other words, your extremes are going to get more and more extreme into the future climate. You add the 85th percentile of the distribution and the 90th percentile of the distribution, and you still see that the 90th percentile threshold that we use to detect these extremes are shifting way more than how your 85th percentile distribution is shifting. We break it down further into seasons. So here's the summer season. Uh, and here's the distribution looks like, and because the summer has more moisture going on, and in the summer what happens is that you're warming up the tropics at a higher scale than you're warming up your winter, uh, your Arctic. So there's a sharper temperature and moisture gradient present in the summer, and that's why you see more and more meridional vapor transport happening in the north. Whereas you move to winter, and suddenly you don't see big shifts happening there. And this is, the Pacific, this is the Atlantic sector, this is the Pacific sector. And if you compare the shifts through the arrows of where the 98% threshold lies, 
you can see that how pronounced the changes are happening in the Pacific and not that much in the Atlantic. Why is that happening? Uh, the regional and the, serious, the seasonal variability is due to how your surface temperature gradient or your moisture gradient at the surface is changing in these two regions and over the seasons as well. So the answer to does uh, how do ARs change in future climate, it's going to be that the frequency is increasing uh, at least across the three seasons of fall, winter, and spring. And the intensity is increasing in all the seasons as you warm up the climate, however, higher in summer and not that much in the winter season. And we move on to the last question, what are AR impacts on sea ice? So for that, we're just going to use the size model, which is community ice code, which is a standard CSM model that they use to simulate sea ice. It's based on the Los Alamos uh, sea ice model, and we're going to look at the daily sea ice concentration and ensemble mean. So how does, first of all, sea ice change between these two climate periods? So if you focus here, I'm showing 1980 to 85, and then 2095 to 2100, and how the sea ice concentration is, sea ice concentration is changing. And you see that starting August, September, October, November, and December, it's just sad that there is no sea ice present in the Arctic. And those open waters are what's causing more air frequency happening in the Arctic. Once you lose that sea ice edge, you have just ocean, and you're going to have more and more much going on. Whereas here you have such a nice sea ice present there. Focusing on the three months, I'm showing you January, April, and June and how the sea ice extent looks like from 0 to 100%. And then looking at how the future one is, and you see that January underwent a big change. So January was supposed to be one of the most sea ice growing season, and you lost a lot of sea ice in January. Whereas April and June are still going strong, which is surprising that your April and June are supposed to be your summer months in the current climate period, but you have more and more sea ice in those, in those months in the future. That means your seasons are also shifting a bit. Like December is now ice-free in the last five years, as shown in the previous GIF. But now June and April are still, still have sea ice present. So how do ARs change the sea ice or like have impacts on the sea ice into the current climate and the future climate in climate models? So again, we are gonna use the same method we used earlier, the changes sea ice, I minus sea ice, previous day. And if you plot the current 25 years and the three months, you see the same spots of sea ice loss happening in the west of Greenland and the Nordic seas in the months of January. The same ones in the months of April, and then more distinct and more northward sea ice loss happening because of these events in the month of June. These plots also coincide well with where you are your most sensitive sea ice region is, like where you have the minimum sea ice concentration from 0 to 30% or 40%. That's where you see this impacts happening. However, these plots do not tell us that whether this change is happening was anomalous or not. So for, for, for June, let's say, what if the June is just losing sea ice? Like how do we know that this sea ice loss was because of an AR and not just a climatological sea ice loss? So what we do is that we calculate anomalous sea ice changes, which is the previously calculated total sea ice change being an AR minus the daily climatological sea ice change. So it's like, give an example. Suppose for a location, the daily climatological change in winter was 5%, and then an AR happened, atmospheric river, and you saw that the total sea ice change was 2%. So what the previous plot's gonna show is that there was 2% gain Whereas what the anomalous sea ice change is going to be is that you lost that 3%. So the next plots are going to be focused on what is this anomalous sea ice change and not just what the AR saw. For the reference, they're also going to be labeled as ESIC from now on, so it does not hold a big space on my plots. And here's the month of January. So I'm showing the anomalous sea ice change and the reds which was the sea ice loss, still holds true, saying that you're going to lose a bit of sea ice in those regions, resulting into a smaller sea ice extent. There's also a bit of sea ice gain happening, very well coincided with where the coastline is. And because it's winter season, 
that gain that you see is not an actual gain, but just a dynamic gain factor. So CS is getting moved when it vectored. Whenever there's a coastline, it's going to stuck there. And that's why you see the gains happening. And the solid line and the dotted line shows what was the CS extent at 15% from 1988 to 2010 to 2015. You see that the, the loss lies pretty well where the, where the CS is more vulnerable. We compare the first 35 years to the last 35 years, and you see that first thing is that CS extends more from the dotted line, from the from the solid line to dashed line. That's how we lost the big CS chunk in the month of January. And you also moved the CS loss a bit northward of where you were seeing this. The dynamic impact still goes through in several locations. To simplify this plot, this partial plot, we'll get the line plots. So we're going to like average how much total area you lose during these events. And it goes from 1980 to 2015 and 2065 to 2095. Here I'm showing on the y-axis that how much sea ice change happened in 1,000 square kilometers. So this is 10,000 square kilometers, 20,000 square kilometers. And the spread is just the ensemble spread. The first thing to notice is that there is a mean sea ice loss signal in both the climate period. There's actually more in the future as you started to lose your sea ice. The future sea ice changes is more variable as compared to your current one, like this ensemble members are simulating different sea ice concentration as you move further, and that's why you have a more wiggly lines there as compared to how much it was happening in the, in the historical time. Notice that there seems like an increasing trend that you're losing less and less sea ice into the future. However, that trend is not an actual trend, but that is just because you had far fewer or lesser sea ice extent, you're also losing less sea ice. So if you normalize the same plots, so this is the plot showing normalized each loss by the area of the year, and this is showing you what the previous plot looked like. Here's your increasing trend that showed up, and that goes away as soon as you normalize it. And this, the bit of the big wiggles that happens at the end is that you don't have sea ice there. So even a tiny bit of sea ice gain or loss is just going to make a big spike there. Uh, we go on to the month of April, and those are the only two months I'm going to show. So the April, the anomalous sea ice, now you see that how much more sea ice gain shows up. Like the dynamic moments are very obvious, but because it's a month of summer, we are not sure whether this is exactly the dynamic impacts or the snow or the blocking of incoming short wave radiation. Like all of those three mechanisms can promote sea ice growth or can simulate this gain. Uh, however, in the last 35 years, you see that the sea ice change has, like the sea ice changes are not too big in any of those regions. And you still see similar patterns emerging out of that, just more north. So your, your loss is also moving with how your ARs are moving deeper into the north in the future. Again, we go back to the line plots. Here's the month of April. Uh, shown in the post simulations, and I mean, CS signal still holds true. Uh, it is less variable in the future because you're not losing a big chunk of CS into the future, and that's why the swiggles are not as crazy as the January month was. And when you normalize it by the area, you still see <coughs> that a mean shift of more CS loss happen as you warm up the climate. So the key takeaway from this month is that your CS becomes more vulnerable and sensitive in the warmer climate to these extreme events as compared to how sensitive it was to the present climate. So what are air impacts on sea ice? Air cause uh, net sea ice loss in the Arctic in the future climate. Conditions apply. <laughs> that it's only the month of January through June where you see this distinct signal. And the months of July to December are hard because at the end of the time period you don't have that sea ice present. So your time series goes to zero, and that is a very difficult thing, which I realized just two days back, working with Evan, that you can spend a whole lot of more time to be with that. So we are not looking into those months for this study for now. So it's just from January to June. So conclusions and summary. We saw that CSM2 has captured this extreme events well. So anyone who, anyone who wants to do Arctic AR stuff, uh, 
this is a good validation that you can pretty much rely on what CSM2 is doing. So it captures the frequency and intensity. How do ARs change in future climate? We saw that there's a seasonality in the changes. You see more frequency in winter, spring, and fall, but you don't see the frequency increase in summer, whereas you see a big change in intensity in summer, but not that big in winter. So the frequency also increases, the intensity increases. The results do match up with other studies, so it's in a consensus that the storms and ARs do increase in the future. And the change in the, in the magnitude of these events heavily rely on how their surface temperature gradients are, show, are changing. This is also validated by some of the other studies. Because the Arctic polar temperature gradients are increasing in summer, whereas decreasing in winter, this is going to cause you to have more northward transport in summer and fewer transport in winter. And lastly, uh, we saw that the sea ice is shifting. Uh, once you put them on the same slide, this looks a bit higher because January had more sensitive sea ice. It had it started losing sea ice, and you had fewer sea ice to start with. Arctic still had a nice and thick enough sea ice that you don't see that big a change, but it's still more lost than how much you were seeing in the current climate. And similar trends and patterns for February, March, and May are also found. So to summarize, future sea ice is more sensitive to extremes like ARs, and we need more reliable climate models in terms of the, to do the, the, the energy budget and the heat budget analysis to break down individual component. The seasons in the Arctic are shifting with warming, and seasons with no sea ice in the future years requires further investigation because it, it is hard to calculate the trends once you don't have any sea ice present. So with that, I would like to wrap up this talk and thank my advisor, Steve, uh, Tristan, and also Liz Maroon, who is present here, which is good. Uh, my NPAR group uh, from Mulder, uh, Christine, Alice, Marika, and Laura, and the very special oceanographers group in the, in the building, which I had weekly meetings and my science discussion with Hannah, Dan, Till, Steve, and Fong, and all the other professors who are here and who I took classes with on Hells here in the front row. Of course, there, Hitchman's there, I can see Hitchman there. So thank you for all the GFT <laughs> classes. Uh, all the friends I made in the building for these years, and also the cats, which are not mine, but Evans, but <laughs> he, kindly, he kindly allows me to, to be a godfather in those cats. <laughs> and lastly, my family and friends in India. Uh, that's my closest family. Those are my parents right there, and all the friends in India. And with that, may the moisture flux be with you for the future climate, and I'll take any questions. All right, thank you, Rudra. There we go. Uh, for that great presentation, you covered a lot of ground, so I'm sure there's going to be questions. Um, yeah. I'll just take the first one directed to Rudra, and then I'm going to sit down and let him do the uh, the end scene. So, uh, let me get a student first, if we can. We've seen a few times that the increased frequency in ARs in the Arctic is due to the ice, the Arctic Ocean being open and being a source of moisture. But more often than not, ARs, the moisture in the source region is more important. And so, what do you think the role, like, do you think it's moisture from like the location you're going to, or what, like, do you think this is telling us something about where the moisture is coming from and the role of infection from these more moisture regions? So, further towards the equator. That is a very good question, and did not get a chance to talk more about the frequency plots. So, my my idea is that that's definitely going to be telling us more about where the moisture is coming from. It's it's because we used a moving threshold. It's not going to capture just Arctic being more moist. So, the moisture is definitely getting infected from the lower tropics. I think that the reason that they go more northward is because that once you start losing the sea ice, you have open water which can fuel the system, so you can have like more ARs going where they are not historically or like conventionally going in the present climate. A cool thing to do in my future work, which we're planning, is that to track the source and the endpoints and see that how they are shifting, not just the frequency. But that is a very interesting point. Thank you. Question. So John. Yes, John. Yeah, great presentation. Group, but really interesting work. I Thank wonder you. if you know the marriage between the AOS and cyclones could be further dissected. 
because I'm wondering if there are certain kinds of cyclone structures that do not export water vapor past 65 degrees more, mm -hmm. or wherever the threshold is, and those that kind of preferentially do. I'm particularly thinking of polluted cyclones might not be able to push the water vapor so far north because the circulation can pull it off. Yeah. Have you thought about that? And have you seen any evidence that there might be some distinction between cyclones that do and don't? So I have not dived deeper into the dynamics part of that, like what cyclones do. Uh, we just started doing analysis to see whether all of these extreme ARs are always associated with which kind of storm. So we're starting with, are those extreme storms with the lowest sea level pressure, which forces these ARs into the Arctic, or there can be another thing which is driving these things, like these ARs into the, into the Arctic. So that's something that we have started thinking about, and we are working on developing the catalogs for the cyclone and see how they're associated. So I don't have an answer for now, but I will talk to you more about that once I have, in the next two months, the, the results. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Angel and Han, I'm gonna go to Angel first. <laughs> uh, outstanding presentation, Rudra. Everything was beautiful. I like beautiful things, so I'm pretty pleased with, the, Thank with you. your presentation. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I, um, this may be just like from la my lack of knowledge of like atmospheric rivers, but one of the things that I, I kept seeing, seeing in your results, the just the general frequency of the rivers and the vapor transfers, and I've been just wondering like how much of this, you know, have you teased out how much of what your results are tied into just Clausius Clavron scaling of of the temperatures in the tropics versus in the poles. Because uh, you know you would think that the temperature going up is going to go down from the melting of the ice and the warming Arctic Ocean, but you would still think that the moist static energy gradient and the entropy gradient yeah. that's going to still get steeper because even though tropical temperatures increase only a little bit, moisture is going to increase a lot more than yeah. in any other latitude just because of the nonlinear yeah. and temperature dependent nature of, of moisture. So I'm wondering like how much of what you're finding is just ultimately rooted. And the Clausius Clapeyron equation, yeah. and like any potential like anchoring of the frequency and intensity of the atmospheric river through the Clausius Clapeyron equation. Yeah, so I have not, the, the decadal algorithm does not factor in that particular thing because it's still going to be warmer temperatures. That just configures the Arctic and it's going to be like more going north. So we have not thought about that thing, although we have discussed about what can be further be done. And I think for that, I might need to step out of the AR bounds and just look at how much the flux is changing in general, because this is a very statistical way of determining extremes. Mm -hmm. So I think the right way to deal with that question would be zoom out and look at how the normal forward flux is changing, which I think it would be a very interesting thing to do. And I have, like Dan and I have discussed that a bit as well. Maybe it's time for you to come back to the tropics. To the tropics. <laughs> I'm going to be pushed out of here. <laughs> I don't mean to jump in, but I had the exact same question. And you know, one way of doing that, if, you're, if your events are determined in the historical record by some sort of a threshold, then a clausius clapeyron scaling of the moisture alone wouldn't change any of your events, if I understand that correctly. Yeah. So you could just take the historical record and scale that by the temperature change to see how much of a, of a, of a transport change hmm. You're getting that would shift your threshold and it would shift the total amount as well. So, just taking your historical moisture, scale it by Clausius Clapeyron as you what you'd expect moving into the future, then you would get the be comparing apples to apples. Yeah, you could then decompose the difference between those two. That would is be a really good interesting suggestion. to see. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Michigan. Uh, this is building on from that, um, IBT is equal parts water and winds. Do yeah. you have any idea if this changes a governed, it's almost built from a closest back one. Is it the winds so, getting windier or the moisture getting more extreme? So the, the answer to that question is very regional specific. I did make some trend plots about where the moisture is increasing and where the winds are increasing. And you see that in the Pacific side, it's a more moisture driven, or like the moisture increases far more than how the velocities are changing as compared to the Atlantic sector where it's like more wind driven than how much heating or moisture is governing. So it's, it's a bit of like, the line plots do not make sense, the distribution I showed, because it's a very regional specific thing. And I have those couple of plots I can share with you later. But it's specific, it's moisture driven, and Atlantic, it's more green, and it's more wind, wind driven phenomena. Hannah and then Liz, I'm sorry, yeah. So Hannah. Liz. 
Yeah, so and this is kind of related to the fossils, clapron stuff. I, I, I'm wondering from an Arctic perspective, um, we see a lot in climate models that we do expect the hydrologic cycle over the Arctic to increase um, in the future. And I'm wondering, do you have some sense then of how much your extreme events play into that relative to this sort of overall mean change and what that may potentially actually mean for the freshwater cycle in the Arctic? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad oh, you asked okay. me that question because I, the fourth part of the study which I'm glad I didn't show because that was almost all the time is the precipitation. So yeah. I'm just showing that how the, there's, <laughs> so, oh, oh, there yeah. so I'm showing a conditional probability that what is the probability that it precipitated when there was an AR present in the Arctic and overall it's more than 50% of the time that this ARs can cause extreme precipitation. But to break down your question about how much is the hydrology changing, showing that how much of the time it snowed from that plot and how much it changed, and this difference is showing how much more rain you got during this event. You see that there's more rain in Arctic, so it's gonna promote more rain. Uh, these extremes are gonna have more and more extreme rain events than snow events. We already started seeing the transition in this last two years where there was more rain events in Greenland. Uh, let's say, for example, However, the climatology is also shifting towards more rain. And because these events are 1% of the time, even across these ensemble members, it's hard to say whether that was just a climatological shift or an actual extreme shift. Yeah. So there, that's a caveat, but there's going to be more rain in the Arctic and to live. I'll ask another question in the vein of positive clapron. I didn't really understand <laughs> The argument about the surface temperature gradients, like how does that change, it, explain the differences? Um, probably because I just missed it. Is it like some sort of verifonicity thing? You change where the surface gradient is strongest, so this changes the synoptic system, or is this like an open ocean thing? You change it, the surface gradient, so you have more open ocean, less sea ice. Uh, yeah, so, so the paper that discussed about that had a more ocean driven, like changes in sea surface temperatures driven arguments as opposed to the baroclinic instability thing, so my guess would also be that it's more related to your how your SSTs are changing, which are going to drive your cyclones, tracks and everything, and apparently your airs as well. So not yes. necessarily the gradient, but just where the sea ice is. That's like, it's a slightly different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I am not sure, Dan, that how that ties back to the mercury instability in the atmosphere yet. Just curious. I didn't understand it. Yeah. Thank you. For the question, but I'm pretty sure I think it's the what I meant was that it's how your sea ice and your SSTs are changing, and not necessarily how your atmosphere directly is changing, but how the SST is covering that atmosphere in return. Yeah. Evan, and then Till. Uh, going back to your comparison between uh, how air is represented in observations versus the climate models, um, I really like the sanity check, and I think it's a good. It's a good thing to do before you start talking about what's going to happen in the future. Um, the thought I had while I was watching it is, so you check the frequency and you check the intensity. Another thing that would be really interesting would be, because uh, the last component of your ARs is, is the shape of the AR. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have these constraints on like how narrow they need to be. And so I was wondering if you could also do like, like take all of the shapes and like find the centroids and find the major and minor axes. Yeah. Might do some distribution of, of what the shapes are and see whether or not the shapes in the climate model mm -hmm. is matching with the shapes that you see in observations. Yeah, uh, that would be a good analysis to do. Uh, a brief answer to that would be it won't match up too much because of just because of the resolution mm -hmm. that these climate models are one by one degree. So, and that's why precipitation is also a little bit wonky that you're not getting that coastline precipitation because it's a one degree by one degree grid. So a brief answer would that it won't match up super well, but I think it would still be nice to see the orientation and stuff, whether they're still doing the same thing. Do you think, think that would be true even if you like, interpolated it to the same resolution before you did that shape? Uh, yeah. That's something that I need to try first and then get back to you, because I'm not sure how the interpolation would work. But I would be cautious in, in doing that. Okay. Yeah. The two. I, first of all, great, great talk, really enjoyed it. Um, you showed those effects of the AR on the sea ice towards the end, uh -huh. and I, 
I think we may have talked about this before. I find it striking how you have these dipoles around all the islands. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering whether it might be easy, or whether you've looked at whether this is mostly a, an advection effect, or is it a precipitation, or? So I wanted to do the, the breakdown of all the effects in the model and see whether how much is accounted by thermodynamic losses, and then the rest is more of your moments. However, I found that there are big biases if I start to break it down, and those would end up adding up. But the rain and snow on sea ice is not simulated well in this climate model. So even though there's snow and rain happening, it won't add up in my budget, and I'm going to see that, hey, what's, it's all winds. So one of my future work or something that if I get money is that we need, we need more simple models to simulate this rain and snow on sea ice understand how that works and then go back and try to merge that merge that with a couple of climate model. That's okay, I can go ahead. Yeah, no, it, it also brings to mind that study by Clancy et al in twenty twenty where they looked at cyclocentric yeah. perspective yeah. on CS. The wind. Yeah. So they they I think I talked to Robin about that. They use the thermodynamic and the dynamic output from the model. Yeah. So they have a thermodynamic CIS and a dynamic CIS. That still will have those biases, the rain and snow wouldn't end up being calculated on the thermodynamic component. So I'm I'm a bit skeptical about about using yeah. that outputs. Okay. Okay, I gotta kick you out. Yeah you have to <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you all for Thanks being so much. Here. Yeah. Yeah.